first off, thank you guys for sticking around to one of the last sessions here at, at Black Hat. I was halfway concerned there'd be like three of us here and maybe we'd just kind of like sit around a table and chat. So thank you for not booking those flights early. Um, as he said, and as the title success, su uh, suggests, we are going to be uh, popping some shells today. Um, particularly in uh, CNC toolkits that um, are very, very popular. Uh, before we get there though, I do want to kind of talk about a little bit of background, a little bit of issues surrounding this. So hang with me, we'll get through the boring stuff and then we'll get to the fun stuff at the end. Uh, quick background on myself. I, I go by the uh, handle alias uh, Professor Plum. I've been in the security community for over 10 years now. I currently work with Symantec as a threat researcher. Before that I worked for the uh, Department of Defense during CNO. And before that I've had my time in the trenches as an IT manager so I know what it's like to fight those fights. Uh, I feel like I have a good roundabout understanding of this from multiple perspectives. And with my background being discussed, um, that shouldn't come as a surprise that I need to make some clear disclaimers. First off, I do not rep my opinions represented here do not necessarily represent those of my current or former employers. I had to make sure I state that. Second is that uh, what I'm going to discuss here is probably illegal from where almost worldwide, some places maybe not, I couldn't speak for everywhere. But don't hold me accountable if, if you decide to use some of this knowledge to do something that you probably shouldn't. Um, I might want to hear about it but don't hold me accountable for anything that's done with this data. Okay, that out of the way, kind of wanted to talk about what really drove me into this field and what, what started this talk. And that is I really, really despise the defeatist attitude in the security community. The attitude that there's nothing we could do to block ourselves against this guy, right? I hear that the sophisticated actor term thrown out there a little bit and I, it's used as like an excuse. Uh, oh, they were sophisticated. We couldn't block them. Oh, it was sophisticated. They, they got past us. And it, it just makes me wonder a little bit like how does that conversation go with the sea levels when you have to explain you've been hacked? It's like, uh, sir, we've, we've been compromised. What? How? How? How did that happen? Oh, the actor was sophisticated. There was nothing we could do. What do you mean sophisticated? Well, we believe he was wearing a monocle so he's clearly, clearly sophisticated. It, it doesn't, to me, the, the, the sophisticatedness is not an excuse in any sort of way. And so that's really what drove this talk. I decided to look at the tools used by these sophisticated actors and show that these attackers are not impenetrable, that they're not above the law and really that they play in the same playing field we do and they make mistakes. So basically we're going to talk about hacking back and this has been a very hot topic for a number of years. Uh, five years ago at this conference there was a anonymous survey done where they asked attendees if they had participated in hacking back and over one third of the, the servants, those surveyed, excuse me, uh, said they had. So it happens. It goes on, right? Uh, a lot of the people feel they need to strike back in some sort of form but first option would be to sue somebody but there's nobody to sue. So legal law enforcement is often left weaponless or can't do anything or, or spread too thin and a lot of times these corporations take matters into their own hands. Add to this a recent bill proposed or not proposed yet but drafted by uh, Senator Tom Graves that is called the Ap Active Cyber Defense Certainty Act or ACDC Act. This bill would leave victims exempt from th the law to hack back against their assailants if this was to be passed. Now at first thought th that bill, like, generally this is considered a bad idea. It's a lose-lose situation, right? You can't hack back and get your documents back. Any media star or any Hollywood star who's had their photos leaked online knows you just can't get files back once they've left your perimeter. And we should know that too. F furthermore, if you do hack back, there's very little for the corporation to gain, right? You're spending your precious resources that you could be using to rebuild or to, s to block your things to instead go attack somebody to just prove a point, to get your revenge, to make yourself feel better in some sort of way maybe. None of that really provides much in the terms of the corporation. Not to mention the risk you're taking on attacking a server that you're not exactly sure where it is or who controls. 
and what's to say that they don't decide to attack back since you're attacking them back and where does it end? What if a third party gets involved and they decide to hack back? It can lead to a very, very messy situation and generally I would recommend it's probably not the best use of this. But there are some areas where I think, think that this kind of technology or this technique may be useful and that's more around attribution and tracking. If one is to hack back into another group and then to just sit quietly and listen, they can observe many things about their assailant. They can observe maybe who else they're targeting, maybe what files they're interested in, what did they pull from you, or how they work. And all of that kind of information, I as a security researcher would love to have because it helps do attribution a whole lot better than just looking at the artifacts that they leave on disk. By sitting and observing the attacker, that's, that's A1 information when it comes to attribution. And to be honest and to be fair, the ACDC Act, that's actually what it tries to do. In fact, the ACDC Act does not allow hacking back for the purpose of causing destruction, damage or physical industry or physical in injury. But instead, it allows hacking back for the establishment of attribution of the criminal activity and to monitor the behavior of the attacker. So to be fair, that th the act does sound like they're trying to do the right thing. Right? It's still opening a can of worms but I think it gets a more than a bad rap than it should probably. Now I know you didn't hear me, come here to hear me ramble on about my emotions or feelings about the issue. So I'm going to cut the rant short here. I'd love to have this conversation over a drink with somebody after the fact but uh, let's get on, move on with things. Um, Got to kind of do some groundwork terminology here. Unfortunately, even C2 communication terminology is kind of confusing. I've heard that the role server and client used interchangeably for the different pieces. So I'm going to outline here the terminology I'm going to use for this. Um, the client piece is the malware piece that runs on the machine and the server is the C2 server. All right? That's how I'm going to use those terms. I'm going to try to avoid using attacker and victim because in our scenarios the attacker becomes the victim and that will cause confusion as well. So the original victim I will call, try to call the target, the original C2 owner I will call the adversary and then the one who is hacking back I will call the retaliator. I like that term. Uh, the dictionary defini nef definition of it is one who returns assault in kind. So I felt that was very appropriate for this role, this setup here. And how I went about my procedure for doing this, a colleague of mine had taken all of the APT reports that have been released over the last few years and kind of summarized, did a popularity hit of what malware tools were most commonly cited in these reports. And I thought, huh, eh, this would make a great shopping list. I'll just start at the top of the list, get a hold of the tool and see what vulnerabilities I can find in it. And so as you see at the top of this list is Poison Ivy and some of you may be aware that Poison Ivy has already been exploited. It's not something I, I was going to hit. It actually was exploited by these individuals at the bottom. I will not try to say their names because I would horribly do, I wouldn't do it justice and I'd just sound like a fool. But these guys found a buffer overflow which allowed remote code execution in the Poison Ivy C2 server. Um, even more interesting is that after malware, uh, after, whoops, after Mandiant released their APT1 report, the, the group, the guys at Malware LU noticed that the, in that report it mentioned that the APT1 group used Poison Ivy. So the APT, so the Malware LU guys exploited the Poison Ivy servers, landed on them and then just listened and observed and enumerated the attacker's network. They then documented all this and provided it publicly. It's one of the rare cases where we have this kind of information from a hack back attempt and the information is golden. They outline, they, they were able to outline their infrastructure. That's an image stolen from their document describing how they have their attacker infrastructure built. They outlined, they found additional tools used by this group and exposed them and they were able to give TTPs of how this group acts so defenders could know better what to watch for and what to look for. It was very insightful and I think it shows just the potential behind this kind of attacking back. Also on that list that already was exploited was Dark Comet. It was down there a ways but I still felt it's wor worth mentioning. Uh, Dark Comet was exploited by these guys and their exploit was uh, remote file retrieval so you could blindly copy a file off that server. But I have no evidence or I have no documentation of where it's been used. Uh, 
shoot, I am rolling. But that's okay. I can just spend more time on the exploits. Let's play with the new stuff now. Um, I'm going to work my way from least interesting up, uh, bottom up on that list. I just took the top three you know, below Poison Ivy. And so the th third one I looked at, the least interesting in my opinion, was Extreme Rat. Uh, Extreme Rat has been around for a little while. It was originally developed as a commercial tool. This is a screenshot of the tool itself. I have one victim and I right clicked on the victim and you can see there that drop down the capabilities the tool offers the attacker to do against their victim. You can spawn shells, draw, grab files, you know, ping, see, just drop a key logger. There's a lot of, a lot of capabilities built in this tool. Um, the tool also has additional capabilities that, that kind of make me laugh. It's got a game built in it that you can kind of play I guess while you're waiting for your malware to land or your guys to click on the email. It was, it looks to me to be a targeting the script kitty. There's a lot of very easy point and click type features here. Um, that being said, it has also still been used by a lot of supposed nation state actor groups. These are a number of news articles where Extreme Rat was cited as the tool of choice for the particular actor. Uh, we, it's been seen in target uh, attacks against the Israeli government, against the uh, uh, conflicts in Syria and the Gaza Strip. Extreme Rat is most ad easily identifiable in my mind based on its uh, C2 communication protocol. Uh, typically, th there's a number of ways it can talk home and communicate home, but typically we see it used either TCP, raw TCP, or a pseudo, a fake HTTP request. The TCP connection, the Vic target component always responds home with a packet that says my version, pipe, and then a number, which is the number of the extreme rat, usually 3.6 or 3.7 or so. Then the server responds with the X character followed by a line feed carriage re return. It's very easy to signature. Uh, there's already snort signatures and such out there for it, but it's easy to identify this. If you see this traffic pattern, it's extreme rat. Alternatively, it can try to mask its c initial call home by making a HTTP request. Um, but that HTTP request is also easy to signature. It always takes the form of a GET request for some number dot functions. And that some number is a password put in by the attacker. And that password is limited to all numbers and it can only be 10 characters long. So it's easy enough to make a regex pattern to look for a series of numbers dot functions. If you see that URL request, that's a, a, a extreme rat trying to beacon home. And once it makes that HTTP request, the, it just turns into a raw socket. It doesn't actually make an official HTTP. It doesn't follow the protocol at all. So I started with lo looking into this guy for exploits, looking for vulnerabilities. Uh, and I just kind of observed how it did its communications. And one of the things that quickly stood out to me was, uh, well, I'll, I'll show you. So when the C2 server wants to deliver a piece of uh, an additional tool to its victim, then it'll send a message to the target component and it says, hey, get ready to receive this file that I have. It's called tool.bad and I want you to save it to C drive, you know, temp, whatever, wherever he wants to try to hide the file. Then the, uh, the victim in this case, the, the target will respond and say, okay, I'm ready to receive your file named tool slash bad.exe. And then the, the extreme rat C2 server will respond with the actual data for that. Now what I find interesting in this ex exchange here is that the C2 server tells the target computer the local path to the file that it has. It doesn't need to tell the victim where it's storing the file locally, but it does for some reason. And it made me think why would it do that? Well maybe it does that because it doesn't want to have to keep any state. It doesn't have to re want to remember the fact that I sent a request to that guy and when he responds ready that I have to go look up what the file name is. He already tells me the file name. He reminds me the file name. And so because of that I thought well if he's not keeping any state then he won't notice if the top packet never happens, right? If I just solicit the fact that I'm ready to receive your file tool.bad, sure enough the extreme rat server will respond by giving me the contents of file tool.bad. So I can blindly retrieve any file from that C2 server if I know where, if I know it exists. Now I can kind of brute force this. I could try every file but that's, that sounds extreme. So just maybe a few ideas of um, things you would want to pull and these are all taken from the URL at the bottom here. Um, maybe you'd want to pull win.ini. It's just kind of a sanity check. That file should exist on all Windows versions. If you pull that back then we, we have a good, okay, we're working as we expect. Uh, you might be able to glean the type of windows that the target is running via, on that fi via that file and if 
you know that, then you know where the event logs are stored. So we can maybe pull back the event logs from the host. The event logs can sometimes have some great information. You might be able to determine the user, uh, user ID of the computer or the user running on the computer. And if you know the user ID, then you can look in their home directory for the desktop.ini file. Because the desktop.ini file may reveal the names of folders on that user's desktop. And if we know the name of folders on that user's desktop, we may have an idea of what kind of things we want to grab. Or alternatively, if they're running as admin, we can always grab the backup of the SAM database and then crack their passwords. We find out the users and maybe we can try to log into the box directly. Or just grab a backup of the registry. There's plenty of great information in there, including file paths to particular items that we may want to then download ourselves. So that's, that was it for Extreme Rat. Really wasn't the most exciting exploit I found, but it was something. And really, I just looked at it just to see if I could find something. It didn't take me more than a day to discover this. It wasn't like it's difficult. And, and that was the. I forgot to mention this earlier, but that's really kind of the point of this talk is that I don't, I don't mean to think that these, the exploits I'm going to show here are amazing or anything. I think, I mean, I think they're kind of fun. But the point is that these tools have these underlying problems, all of, like all of them. It's very rich in this fact. If you're a vulnerability researcher, this field is ripe for the picking. Uh, simply just need to get a hold of the C2 servers. Anyways, let's get some more some fun ones. Uh, plug X, core plug or distor, is uh, more common rat that has been ex that has been described in numerous nation state or sophisticated actor attacks. Um, here is a screenshot of the tool, and the, the second pop-up pop -up window shows you the options you can do to your target. Um, some of them around there that are notably interesting to me are one you can edit the registry on the target. Um, you can start capturing packets. You can connect to a different telnet server through your target and it also contains functions for even talking to SQL servers. Like I, like I mentioned it has been indicated in numerous attacks. Um, Office of Personnel Management was one of the attacks in which they found the uh, plug X variant of the malware in use. And it's been around for quite some time, at least 2008. So that's almost 10 year run, a 10 year reign. And it's been used even, even up to this day. I think there's an article there, uh, oops, they did it again from February of this year, where again, Plug X was found. Uh, the Black Hat Asia talk, I know you want to unplug me, was very useful for my talk. They did a lot of research into the tool and the different variants and provided some great info for me so I didn't have to do a lot of additional RE. And so I was able to, uh, I will, I'll get there in a second. I, um, I s didn't have source code for this one. I didn't, and so I decided to do a little bit of fuzz run to, to see what exploits I could find or vulnerabilities I could find, excuse me. But my fuzz run was kind of overwhelming to tell the truth. The, the coding in this is so deplorable in my mind, deplorable in my mind. It would cause so many expo uh, exceptions to be flagged when I run my fuzz run that I really didn't get an edge up as where to start. I had so many exceptions being thrown and they were all the exceptions that could show potential to be exploitable that I'll say, okay, well, which one do I start with? And in the end, I kind of started with one, uh, something that looked interesting to me when I, when I just started. When I started, I was trying to make my fuzzer very unique to the protocol and I noticed something interesting in the protocol and I made a note on the side saying, eh, I might want to come back to this. And in the end, that's where I started because the fuzz run results were overwhelming. And where that was was in the set of code that has to deal with decoding a packet as Plug X calls it or a message more as we should think of it. Um, this is my obligatory IDA Pro screenshot. And this, this function here is the handling of a message as received from a victim or a target. And what it does, every message has a header that's XOR encoded with some made up XOR, rolling XOR key that's, I don't know, they must have made up their, I've never seen it used anywhere else. They just kind of made their own thing up. But anyways, once that XOR key is decoded, then it validates that the message size is small enough to fit it on the stack and that, that 61K, it must fit on the stack. And if it's not large enough, if it's not small enough to fit on the stack, then it shows this error message that's very descriptive about what the problem is. However, this code to, ch to decode the header and make sure it fits on the stack comes down here in this decode packet function which is after the packet is cal copied onto the stack. So it does you very little good to check if your message fits on the stack after you've copied your message onto the stack. 
in this case it does provide a little bit of a hindrance to me but um, I thought it was, it thought it was really a, a fun bug so I decided to, to use it in this presentation. So here we can throw in a message that's bigger than the, the stack buffer and then we can, we would gain execution as soon as this function returns. But the function is not going to return until it checks the stack size. So thus the attacker when we exploit this is going to see this pop up message on their machine that very clearly to them describes the problem that they're about to face, right? This error message PE decode packet clearly lets them know you've just been exploited and somebody is going to grain shell on your box. Furthermore, this error message isn't just unique to this code path. If you just nmap scanned some of the plug X variants, they show this exact message. It's kind of like, I, I assume it's kind of like the default, I don't know what went wrong here message. And so this guy pops up on the attacker's machine and it doesn't matter how they acknowledge it, if they click the X or if they click OK, as soon as this message box is acknowledged, then code flow falls into our hands. So I have here a demo video of this. Um, on the, I'm going to get my mouse in the right spot. On the right hand side of the screen, I'm representing the adversary's machine. And on the left hand side of the scene, I, screen, I am representing the retaliator. So I'm going to start up the plug X rat variant here, and it's running. And on the other side, I have a Metasploit module for this. I'm starting up that Metasploit module to exploit this plug X bug. Think. All right, I'm going to set the target address, which I've already, I, I know, right? It's just my VM in this case. And then I'm going to show some info here. I want to pause this right there. So here in my module, that you see here at the top, it says um, type. Um, from that Asia, from that talk, I know you want to unplug me from Black Hat Asia. They describe plug X variants. There's like three main types, as they put it and they kind of broke them up based on their XOR decoding function. Uh, we have to be able to make a packet that decodes right. So there's basically I need, you need to know what variant your target is. The good side is, is you can just try it with a, a message and if it doesn't work then you can try another one and just so basically you can just try all three until you find the one that works. And that's what I'll do in this, uh, do next is I'll run a check command. And sure enough that one says yeah, you, the type you've selected is right. The message, it looks vulnerable. And so we'll throw our exploit. You see here the pop-up message. Uh, as soon as the attacker acknowledges that in some way, we are spawning the uh, interpreter session there on the left. Comes up, I'm going to run a sysinfo, get a little info on my target, spawn a shell, and we'll pop up a notepad just as proof. And boom, execution on the C2 server. All right. Next up, last one on my list was Ghost Rat. I saved this one for last because this one I've seen everywhere. Um, I think many incident responders know this guy by heart. Ghost Rat's been around for 10 years. It was originally written by a team that called themselves C. Rufus, um, aka Red Wolf Security Team. Um, been attributed to a lot of uh, nation state attacks based out of the Asia Pacific region and very well known. The source code has been leaked online to this tool which means it's also now being used by script kiddies and sophisticated actors alike. Here's just a handful of news media reports where this guy has been observed in the wild. Um, we've seen it against NATO, Associated Press, Office of the Dalai Lama, the U.S. government, private businesses. I mean I could go on. Um, most notably Operation Night Dragon, Pity Tiger, APT-18. Dynamite Panda, they've all been cited to use this guy. Very, very common cool toolkit. And again, easily signaturable based on its C2 traffic. Um, the path, the traffic always starts out with a five byte marker, which is usually ghost, spelt with a zero, followed by two uh, int variables and then a gzip, or not gzip, um, an L LZMA uh, compressed buffer. Since the source code has been leaked online, we've seen variants come up where they try to change that marker to hide who they are, but they usually just change it to a different five byte variable. So it's still very signaturable. Um, the, the list here of different five byte markers that we have observed or have been observed are from a, a colleague's paper, Sonora, um, observed all these and, and I just stole that from him. 
But this guy was also very vulnerable. Uh, it had a vulnerability very similar to the extreme rat but this time the other way. This when the attacker wants to pull a file from his target the attacker sends a message that looks something like this. It will say give me your file C drive documents user you know file dot doc. So I can save it to folder x file dot something another. Target responds okay here's the data so you can save it to this location. And like the other case the first packet's not necessary. So we can arbitrarily start telling the ghost server hey here's the file you requested please save this to your startup folder for me if we know where its startup folder is. Granted the startup folder moves around a lot in Windows so this might not be the best way to do this. So I was thinking what, what's the best use of this arbitrary file upload? But it turns out DL Ghost Rat provided a great use for this and that is Ghost Rat has a sideload vulnerability. If we drop a DLL file in the relative directory called OLE DLG then the next time Ghost starts up it will load that library looking for just one function. That one function is OLA UI busy. And all that does is ask if the UI is busy. So we can quick, we can make a DLL, a malicious DLL that does whatever we want and as long as it exports this one function and always returns yes, I'm busy, then Ghost, it will be none the wiser and we have our back door into the Ghost Rat. Unfortunately, this requires Ghost to be restarted and it requires dropping a file to disk. And I wanted something better than that, so I continued looking. And didn't take long. Looking at the source code made it a whole lot easier. But uh, I have this one here. This is in the parsing code of the drive list given from a victim back to the adversary. And here you can see that it copies the list of drives, buff the buffer of the list of drives and it uses the size of the list of drives get as given from the target rather than the size of the buffer on the server. Trusting that the list of drives on a victim will never be longer than a thousand characters because obviously there's only going to be 26 characters, 26 uh, drives on a machine, right? That buffer exists within this particular C class and so we can overwrite anything that falls below the uh, you see the remote drive list that 1k buffer there. That's the one who will overflow. So we can overflow any, we can overwrite anything below that. There's a number of uh, class pointers below there which means anytime any function inside one of those classes below that gets called we control the pointer to that function pointer. So if to get execution we just have to have a pointer to a pointer to our shell code. Now to get that it would be great if I had an information disclosure vulnerability. Unfortunately I'm lazy and I didn't go find one. I don't, I, I suspect somebody could find one rather easily if they wanted to but I'm lazy. So I just did the heap spray approach where I spray the heap and then assume that I, I know where I'm going to land. I also worried about DEP um, but it turned out that on any machine that forced DEP to be enabled, ghost rats, the C2 server component would not run at all. DEP seemed to break the server. So in all cases where I've seen ghost rat running, I don't assume DEP is working. I also have a demo for this one. Uh, before I get there I wanted to talk about something else cool and that is some work by uh, Kevin the Hermit. He has written a series of decoders for these malware components. So if you have the malware piece from any one of these, the ghost or extreme rat or poison ivy, then he can extract, you run this code against it and it will extract the configuration file giving you the address of the C2 server. So if you've been attacked and you have a sample, we can extract the C2 server and then you can go attack the C2 server. Or if you don't want to wait until you're attacked, you can go hunt virus total, pull the information there. Or we can just ask Shodan, right? Shodan just recently announced a malware hunter capability where one of the types of servers that they hunt for are ghost C2 servers. So you can quickly do a search on ghost C2 and maybe, or Shodan looking for ghost C2 servers and find yourself a lovely list of targets there. All right, I have the demo now with that out of the way. This time I'm going to do it a little differently. Uh, I'm going to actually make a malware piece out with the uh, Ghost C2 server and I will deliver that to my victim or whatnot. Usually that's delivered via phishing email or whatever trick you want. But since this is a VM, I just kind of drag it over outside the space. Uh, I made a mistake there. I closed my C2 server, so I realized mistake in a second here, and I'll start it back up. But uh, my retaliator 
we're going to run that decoder command against my piece of malware and there you see the C2 address which we already knew but proof of concept there. Uh, I realized a mistake, started C2 server back up. On the retaliator side I'm now starting meterpreter. We're going to ready this module. Uh, all we need to do to ready it is to s oh, well first uh, decide to use it. We're going to set our remote host to the one we extracted from the malware itself. Uh, just show some info on it, make sure everything looks good. If they're using a the magic other than ghost, we can change it to match their magic. Um, if you do a check and it's not ghost, it will tell you, hey, I think this is the magic, you should change it. And then we run the exploit. Now, because I decided to do a heap spray, it's going to take a little while to completely fill out the heap before we get execution. But there it is. We start sending our interpreter sh uh, stager back. And once I get my console, I believe I do a sysinfo. And we're going to pop count just as more visual proof that we have execution on the target. So the question now is what? What to do now? And to be honest, I'm not quite sure. This is not really an area that's been documented, at least publicly, what to do when you're on an attacker's machine. But these are some things I would think or suggest that would probably be interesting. Uh, one of the first I would suggest is to run netstat because that would show you any outbound connections from that host. So if there is any other victims that they are remote controlling via their ghost implant or their plugex implant or whatever, you would see who else is a victim. They're at least their IP address. Uh, every one of these tools has a folder where they store files downloaded from their victims and I would suggest maybe searching that to see what type of files are they interested in, what have they been gathering. If you know what they have been gathering and who they're targeting, that's very useful information. Uh, maybe you want to install persistence, maybe you want to hang around for quite some time and watch these guys and maybe install a keylogger. You might find out what else they're interested in or maybe their Facebook profile if they decide to log in while they wait. Maybe steal their credentials and start numerating the network. I'm not really sure which of these are good ideas and maybe they're all bad ideas. Uh, like I said, it's a discussion that probably still needs to be had because it's a relatively undocumented, at least publicly undocumented area. But whatever you do, I definitely suggest you lie low and watch. Not try to cause damage, not try to get revenge, but observe. Uh, that's really hard to see but if you squint and pretend, that's supposed to be uh, ASCII art of Sun Tzu up there. Um, with that, just kind of close up, I want to give thanks to um, Bryce Kuntz who uh, he presented last yesterday but uh, he's been doing this kind of development stuff. He likes to try to find exploits against these and he's been doing it for much longer than I have. Um, but with that, thank you very much. Um, I have time for questions. If you enjoyed this, please uh, fill out the survey and while you're filling that out, I can take some questions if anybody wants. Thank you.